It was a year of some soaring highs and one particularly plummeting low as Rory McIlroy returned to number one in the world. Rory, you never have uh, years which are in any way ordinary, but 2022 had a certain ordinary, extraordinariness about it that rose it above others, even without a major win. How would you characterize 2022? Yeah, I think 2022 was a, um, a year that, with so much noise going on outside the ropes, I was able to find a lot of quiet inside the ropes. Um, and that quiet contributed to very consistent golf, uh, a lot of chances to win. Obviously didn't win one of the big ones, but um, you know, I basically did everything else this year. So uh, it, was a, it was an interesting year, but um, really proud of, of how, I've, how I've played and, and, and the performances that I've been able to put in. You were on a good track in 2019, then COVID hit and you slumped down to 16 in the world 18 months ago. And now, you know, you've fought all the way back to number one. Like, what changed? What really changed for you? So, um, I had some momentum um, early, early in 2020. I was the number one player in the world. Uh, then COVID hit. And obviously, momentum stopped. Uh, I went back out to play again whenever we were, you know, we went back out to play in June. Uh, I didn't see Michael Bannon, my coach, for a few months, and my swing maybe started to deteriorate a little bit in terms of like I didn't have someone keeping a watchful eye. And then I maybe sort of dived into my swing a little bit too much, and um, I felt like making my golf swing better was going to contribute to making my, my game better and, and the scores that I should better. And, and I sort of went down that path for a while uh, into 2021 as well uh, and, and realized that that wasn't the path that I needed to be on to, to get back to, to the player that I, that I know that I can be. So um, it was really the Ryder, Ryder Cup and after the Ryder Cup in 21 where I decided that I needed to go back to trying to be myself and not try to be someone else and not try to swing a different way or swing a way that was was maybe um, slightly unnatural for me. Uh, and once I did that and once I sort of got my own DNA back into my golf game, things started to, to pick up again. And then there was, and there almost always has to be a moment. And that moment seemed to be Augusta, final round, 64, holding the bunker shot in 18. You left Augusta happy. You haven't always left Augusta happy, maybe never left Augusta as happy, and yet you finished second. Mm. Was that the moment when it began to change? I think that was one of the moments. I think there was a few moments along this journey. Um, I think one of the big moments for me was the Saturday of the Ryder Cup at Whistling Straits. It was the first time I'd ever been uh, dropped or rested for a session. Uh, and it and it it was very fair, you know. I I wasn't playing well that week, and it it hit home with me that that was it was it was a very low point in my career. Um, and then I went out on that Sunday singles of the Ryder Cup and was able to beat Xander Shoffley that day, and that was the first moment. That was the first moment when I realized, okay, I think I know what I need to do to get back on the right path. Two weeks later, I, I win the CJ Cup, and it was it was a great win. And then, fast forward, I think there's always little moments along the journey. I think the the Augusta moment was more um, that gave me such a huge shot of confidence, knowing that I can go to Augusta, I can play well, I can play with freedom, I can shoot 64 in the final day. Yes, it wasn't good enough to win, but I thought it was a huge breakthrough for me at Augusta after all those years of, of struggle and um, maybe playing carefully and tentatively. And, and it, it was, it, I proved to myself that I could play with freedom at Augusta and, and, and do really, really well. You contended in the US PGA Championship. Uh, you were right in there in the US Open. You win the Canadian Open. You go to St. Andrews with clearly a lot of positive momentum, and you're right in contention, and then you're in share of the lead entering the final round. 
It was an emotional week, 150th Open, you were made an honorary member of the RNA, but it didn't happen and, and it, it caused tears. And it was that hard. Just yeah. how do you, how have you processed it since and what was it like at the time? It was much tougher at the time than it that obviously is now, I think, after you know, now having months to reflect on it. But I even think I even think um, having even a week to reflect on it afterwards, it was really tough at the time. You know, I thought, this is the chance. I'm gonna win that that fifth major finally after, you know, seven or eight years or whatever it was. And it didn't happen. And it's really hard to see um, to see the picture clearly at that time, but I think a week or two after that, you reflect on it and you think, I'm way closer to winning a major now than I have been in a long, long time. So it was there was disappointment at the start, but then enthusiasm and excitement moving forward. It's like, no, I'm, you know, this is, it's a journey again. And, and I've said this before, I feel like I'm on this journey to try to win my first major again which is a really great feeling. It's a great feeling. Instead of trying to have the burden of, of, oh, he hasn't won one in eight years, it's sort of like, well, no, I'm just, I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to win a major and I feel like I'm on that, I'm on that journey and I'm getting closer and I'm sort of laying the, the foundations and, and sort of doing it step by step and uh, really excited for the majors next year because I, you know, I, I, I haven't felt this good going into a, a season, especially a major season in a long, long time. How much did the conversation that you had with Jack Nicholas at Memorial, the arch winner in, in all, all circumstances, 18 major championships, you had this conversation and he said something to you about, you know, that cliche that you learn from your losses, but he said you learn more from how you win mm. and winning. Did that make a difference? Did that flick a switch? Uh, a little bit, yeah. I, I think there's, there's lessons to be taken from everything. You know, you, you learn some things when you win, you learn some things when you lose. Um, and I think all of those lessons culminate in, at the end of the day, achieving what you want to achieve. I think a lot of things go into it. Um, the one thing that Jack did better than anyone else was, was put himself in position to win. You know, he, he won 18 times, but he finished second 19 times. So. He just put himself more than anyone. He put himself there more than anyone else. So the law of averages suggests that you put yourself more there than you're there more than anyone else. You're gonna you're gonna win more, um, and that's sort of the way I'm looking at it. The more I just put myself in that position, week after week, major after major, it it will happen. The FedEx Cup gave you a victory, not a major, but it gave you such a satisfactory victory. Six behind entering the final round. Uh, level with Scotty Scheffler after seven holes of the final round, then you're in a dogfight. Mm. And then you hold a bomb of a 40-footer across the 15th green, and it's the decisive moment. Did that salve the wounds, for want of a better way of saying it, to, to some degree of St. Andrews? To some degree. Um, I certainly still would have preferred to win the Claret Jug over the FedEx Cup. I think no one's going to argue with that, but it, it softened the blow. It made what was a very good but disappointing summer, uh, a very good summer. I wouldn't say it was a great summer because I had a chance to win the 150th Open at St Andrews, which would have been the biggest achievement of my career. Um, but it softened the blow of not being able to get that done. So um, I feel like I've come to terms with it. And I think the great thing about being a golfer is every year, you've got four other opportunities to, to win those major championships, among, among everything else, but I think everyone recognize it, recognizes it as, at this point of my career, you know, I'm you know, predominantly gonna be remembered for the, the major championships that, that, I, that I have won and hopefully that I will win in the future. And you're getting back to number one, 10 years after you first achieved number one, the fight back to get number one, how satisfying has, has that been? Again, it's a little bit like the, I talked about this journey of, of, of laying the foundations to win a major again. It's, almost, it's also been this journey of, of getting back to, to number one, you know, being number one at the start of COVID to, the, as you said, you know, dropping down to 16th in the world in the middle of the summer in 2021. Um, I'm building my way back up to, to, to number one. I think it's, 
there's so many little steps on that journey. And I think if you can just methodically and, and um, sort of purposefully just go step by step, tournament by tournament, shoot good scores after good scores, you know, you do that time and time again, you know, it, it all sort of takes care of itself. You still need to take advantage of the, of the opportunities. Um, but all these things in golf and the luxury of golf is you, you're on a journey and it's not, you don't have to do it right away and then you don't have another opportunity for two years or four years. It's every single week, every single year, you have those opportunities and, and that's, that's one of the great things about golf. You can get back on the horse straight away. You did everything in 2022, so much. Uh, even the, the, the experiences which weren't great, and, and, but all those three victories. In the backdrop of Live Golf, you being the Player Advisory Council chairman and the appointed spokesman. And for your, to all intents and purposes, you wanted to be out there to oppose Live Golf and to advocate for the PGA Tour. It has to end at some stage. How does it end, this war? Yeah. Um... I think I, I wanted to advocate for what I believed in. Um, and look, we're not, we're not solving the world's problems here. This is golf at the end of the day. But I, I believe in something, which I think is very different than, than what live golf is. But I think one of the things that was good for me this year is I've spoken a lot of words about it, but I felt like those, those words needed to be backed up by actions. And that was on me to, to go out there and back up my words with, with the actions of, of playing really good golf. And, and, and I was able to do that. So I probably put myself under more pressure than I should have, but I was able to back it up and I was, I was really proud of that. And you said that Greg Norman has to go as the chief of LIV, so to speak, before, as you've put it, the adults get around the table and sort this out. What do you mean by that? I just think he's become too divisive of a figure. I, I, I think there's no, there's no hope of, of dialogue going forward if, if he's involved. I think he was brought in to be a disruptor. He has disrupted the game in a big way. Um, but I think now it's time for, like I would, I'd love to, to play regular golf against Cam Smith and Dustin Johnson and, and Brooks and Bryson and all the guys that have, that have left. Like I, I, and I'm not saying, I mean, we have, plethora of amazing golfers on the PGA Tour and the DP World Tour, but I think the game is healthier as a whole if we're all playing together. So Greg's done his bit, he's been disruptive, he's been divisive, but now I think it's time for, you know, he's done his job. So I think it's time now for, for, for someone to come in and, and, and for cooler heads to, to talk about this. And, and if, if that happens, I think the game of golf will, will hopefully end up in a, in a better place than it is right now. In all of this, you have great balance in your life. You've got a tight team around you. Your family is a huge part of that team, your mother, your father, but also, of course, Erica, your wife, and Poppy, your daughter. And there was a lovely interaction between you and Poppy after the CJ Cup, and you went to number one, that FaceTime. It's hugely important, that little extra element over the last few years, isn't it? Oh, it's massive, I think. As, as I said, with the amount of noise that goes on outside of the ropes for me in terms of all the live stuff and, and everything else, to have my golf and my family and my inner team um, in such a good spot and everything is, is, there's no noise in that, right? There's no noise, there's no, you know, that, that part of my life, which is the most important part, is is as, as good as it could be. And, and that's, that's really important and it's, it's probably part of the reason why I, I have played so well this year. And a lovely family or and or over Christmas to come. You must really be looking forward to that after the year you've had. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, it's, there's been a lot of travel, there's been a lot of golf. You know, it's, it's, I've, I've been very busy this year on, on all fronts. So to you know, maybe turn the phone off for a couple of weeks uh, when I get back get back to Florida and really spend some time with them. Um, I'm, I'm excited for that. Rory McIlroy, a great year. Three wins, FedEx Cup champion for the third time. The best of luck, looking forward to 2023. Thank you.